Okay, we don't need better back to our seat. We are in the midst of a series. I'm calling it the Spirit, the Water, and the Blood. And uh, that phrase comes from the Apostle John. It was something he wrote in his letter. And he said, there are three things that testify to faith in Jesus Christ. And it's faith in Jesus that John says that is, that is through this faith in Jesus that God is overcoming the sin and the, all the things that are wrong, basically, that have defiled and defaced God's good creation. And he says this, the spirit and the water and the blood testify to this. We've been talking about it. We talked about the blood. And uh, as Joe and Gene just led us through communion, the blood is, is a way of saying, it's, it's a way of expressing or picturing that love that is expressed through self-sacrifice. And of course, the ultimate expression and example of that is Jesus Christ himself, who for the love of the world and for the love of you, he was willing to let the world crucify him in his death that you could be made right with God and that God's purposes could be released on the earth. And so, and of course, it's just a picture not just of of death, but just a life that is, a love that is expressed through a self-sacrificial life. That's what the blood represents. And so it's love expressed in this self-sacrifice that's part of the testimony that God is making the world right through faith in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, there's the water, and water speaks to the, I like to say, it speaks to the reality and the substance of divine life. Jesus said, I came to give life and to give it abundant. And we know that God is like the happiest, most fulfilled being in the universe. And he has this incredible life, if you will, this incredible existence of joy and peace and, and love. And he, and he wants to share what he has with us. And of course, you were, you were born with life, but he has so much more for you. And the, and the water represents this reality and this substance. Jesus said, he who believes in me will have rivers of living water flowing out of his innermost being. And he's speaking about this inner life that comes from God, from relationship with God, from union, communion with God that flows out of us. And then he says there's also the spirit, of course, which is God himself. God is spirit, who is spirit, and, and he's testifying. So now we've been talking about this, and last week we talked about the spirit. We talked about uh, from John 3, 16, where John said, you must be born again. Or I, actually, I think a better way to say it is you must be born from above. And just as you were born into this world and given a body and a, and a soul and a spirit, Jesus said there's also another birth. And it's through this birth which comes from above. It comes by the spirit of God doing the work in your inner person. He says and when that happens, just like when you were born from your mother's womb and you came into this world, he says when you're born from above, you now see and enter into the kingdom of God which represents that realm where God is present and God's, God rules. The gospel we talked about last week is not that the God makes bad people good. It's that God makes dead people alive. And of course, being alive is good, and being dead is bad. So in that sense, yes, he goes and takes you from bad to good, but, but it's really making you... You were dead and you were alive. And how I many know you can, you can have breath in your lungs and still be dead? As Paul said, we were dead in our trespasses. And what he means is we were, we were in that separation from God. And when, you be, when God makes you alive, he makes you alive to him. All right. So this morning I want to just continue talking about the Holy Spirit. I want to specifically talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the filling of of the Holy Spirit. And I want to just start actually in Isaiah. So I'm going to go to Isaiah. Isaiah 64. It's going to be good this morning. All right, Isaiah. This is what Isaiah says. Some of you may be familiar with this. He, he prays this prayer and he, he says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down 
that the mountains might quake at your presence as fire kindles the brushwood and fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries. That the nations may tremble at your presence when you did awesome things which we did not expect. You came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. For from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. And I love this phrase, or this prayer really. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Unfortunately, some Christians are still praying that, not realizing it's actually happened. I want to talk about that this morning. What does it mean for the heavens to be rent? I mean, I mean, to tear apart the heavens, if you will, to open the heavens. It might be another way. Oh, that you would open the heavens and come down. Like, well, what does that mean? Well, how about if we just start with what exactly is heaven? All right, now, heaven is not a location somewhere out there. And, okay, someone got excited. Okay, good. In today's language, we might say something like heaven is actually another dimension. All right, yes, when God created this universe, he created physical material, he created physical laws, but guess what? There is more to the world than meets the eye, so to speak. There is more to this creation that God created than just what you can see with your eyes and touch with your hands. There is more. And the Bible actually refers to God's creation as heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Another way of maybe looking at it is to think of heaven as the unseen part of God's creation and the earth as the seen part. Heaven is the place, we're told that, it's like like heaven is the place where where God dwells, so to speak. It's the place where, uh, oftentimes heaven is depicted, is, is pi- de- depicted, is pictured as, as up. The heavens are up. Now that's not about location. It's not saying the heavens are somewhere up there somewhere. When the Bible says the heavens are up, what it means is heaven is sovereign over the things of the earth. And so heaven is the place where God rules and reigns, if you will. He is sovereign over his creation. And heaven is that that realm, if you will, because God is spirit for which God dwells and, and rules and reigns, so to speak, and is sovereign and watchful over all of his creation. And so it's that unseen part of God's creation that represents his presence and his oversight. And guess what? Heaven and earth were always meant to be joined and united and work together. And it was God's destiny that that heaven and earth would work together through you and through us. That was, you guys are a little quiet this morning. It's okay. I'll get better. If you pray. And so it was always this idea, it says that, that, that God, we were made in God's image and placed within his creation. God gave you a body to live within his physical creation, but it was always meant to be done in relationship with him so that heaven and earth would work together. That was always God's intent. So heaven, so, so, why, so why pray that the heavens would be opened and that God would come down? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, things are a little awry on the earth. Something has gone seriously wrong. I mean, the world is an amazingly beautiful place. God's creation is amazing and good, but it certainly has been defiled and defaced and a little bit spoiled in many different ways. And something has gone seriously wrong. And the Bible puts its finger on that and calls it sin. And the end result is that it's like the heavens and the earth have been separated. And there's this un, it's, it's this chasm between the two that we can't seem to cross. And suddenly 
what should be obvious is no longer obvious. Suddenly we're blind to the reality that there is a good creator who oversees this creation and loves us and is good. Paul says there are just certain things that should be obvious to everybody. Just even from looking at the things that God has created. And what should be obvious is that there is a creator. And it should be obvious that he's good. But we're blind to that. And in our blindness to that and in, 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 all, in our pride and all kinds of other human dysfunction and unbelief and all, all different ways in which that gets expressed, we just go it our own way and we just mess things up pretty bad. And we get a little full of ourselves and think we can figure this out. And, and it just, just makes things worse. And so there's this cry in the Old Testament that, hey, that God would reestablish his purpose. That he would open back up the heavens. Because despite our attempts to climb there, it doesn't work. And so one of the things that we see throughout the kind of the story that we see in the narrative of the Old Testament and God's working first through Abraham and then through the nation of Israel and then through the man Christ Jesus leading up to that God establishes the temple and the whole point of the temple was this represented heaven and earth united again it represented this place where heaven and earth would intersect and where God would dwell and where God's reign would come forth. That's what the temple represented. That's why it was so central to the very life of the nation. It represented this place where heaven had come to earth and intersected. And where God would dwell, where God would rule. But the prayer here of Isaiah was that that was never meant to be the end all be all. As if God would live in a building created by human hands. But the prayer was that God, you would open up the heavens for everyone. And that you would dwell within your creation and specifically within your people. How would, how would this happen? And this is the prayer in the Old Testament, the prayer of Isaiah. Oh, that you would open up the heavens and that you would come down and that your presence would dwell among men and that your rule and your oversight would be seen and recognized and produce all the good it's supposed to. How is this going to happen? And of course, the answer we find in Jesus. He's always the answer, I know. It's a Sunday school answer. Just answer Jesus, you'll probably get the question right. And of course, in Jesus, God comes down. Comes down and takes on the form of a man, but, he, but it's God. And he comes down and he says, listen, this, this temple is just a, it's just a picture to a greater temple that God wants to build. And if you hold on to this, it'll only bring destruction. And of course, that actually happened in history. That prophecy came to pass. But more importantly, the greater prophecy that God would do a new thing and he would build a new temple also has come to pass. And of course, that temple is a, is a community of people. That's why we talk about the church as a, as a people. It's not a building, it's a people. It's a community. It's a community of people who have faith in Jesus. And in this community, and you as an individual who has faith, and as us as a community, and of course, River is just one of many communities of believers. We have a, we have a class after church, by the way, for those who might be interested in learning about membership. You can become a member here of the River, but, but really your membership is in the, the body of Christ. It's a worldwide membership that includes every believer in Jesus. It's God's family, another way that the Bible describes it. As a family, that God's creating a family. He created humanity as a family. And we're brought back into family in Jesus Christ. And, th and it's through this community of people that God wants to bring back heaven and earth to work in cooperation and to be united. And if you go to the end of the book, you discover, guess what? That's exactly where all this is happening. It's fulfilled in Jesus, but he is now reigning and ruling. He didn't leave. He ascended. There's a difference between leaving and ascended. All right? He may have left our visible sight, but he didn't leave. He ascended. And he is now cooperating with the Lord and by the Holy Spirit 
on the earth to bring this whole thing to its proper conclusion. I just want to turn to Matthew. I'm just kind of setting the stage, but we're going to talk about your individual baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is Jesus coming to be baptized. He's coming to be baptized in water. And this is Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 13. I think they're going to put it on the screen for us. Matthew 3, 13. And you may have heard about this dude called John the Baptist. And um, he was out in the, in the desert, by the way. If you, if you come to Israel with me next year or the year after, I'll actually take you out to the desert. You can get baptized in the Jordan. We'll show you where all this happened. But he was out there baptizing, and of course, yes, do it. That's right. <clears throat> he was baptizing, and it was, he was preparing the way for, this, for, for the Lord himself. And it says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Now, it's kind of a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism recognizing God's going to do a new thing. I need to leave the old behind, and I need to accept the new thing that God is doing, which is what happens when we get baptized in water. We're basically playing that out, and we're kind of publicly acknowledging and accepting that, hey, that the old me is kind of is passing, and there's a new me, and the new me knows God, and the new me knows has faith in Christ, and the new me is filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is going out to be baptized, and John says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So try to prevent him saying, I have need to be baptized by you. Like, why are you coming to me? Now, why would he say something like that? Well, if you look at the ministry of John, John had prophesied that, hey, listen, there is one coming who is greater than me. I'm just preparing the way. I'm just a voice in the wilderness crying out that the thing that God said he was doing is about to come on the scene. There's someone someone greater coming, and he's not going to baptize you in water. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, remember in Isaiah 64, it says, oh, that you would open the heavens, but that you would send a fire that causes the water to boil. Water being a picture of the divine life. Oh, that God would send a fire that would cause this divine life to boil and bubble up on the earth. And John says, oh, he'll do that. It's called Holy Spirit. And so he'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit and the fire that brings this divine life bubbling forth boiling hot, full of passion. And so John's like, uh, yeah, you don't need to come to me. <laughs> I need the baptism that you're bringing, Jesus. And Jesus was like, don't worry about it. Just, just go ahead and do this. Let's just do this thing. <clears throat> Verse 16 says, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, What's it say? The heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, the voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Isaiah 64. Happening right there. The heavens are opened. God has come down now. He he already came in the form of his Son, Now he's coming as the dove, in other words, the Holy Spirit, to rest upon the Son. Isn't that amazing? Just setting you up. Acts, now we go to Acts, and Acts is uh, written by Luke, who was a disciple, and uh, Luke went and did a lot of research and wrote this book, and it was, the, the book of Acts is really, should probably call the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This is what happened after Jesus ascended and the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And wow. I'm going to go to Acts uh, chapter 7. Actually, you could maybe pick it up in in chapter 6 and there's this cool story about this man named Stephen. So again, the book of Acts is kind of recounting the the early church. What's happening is the early church gets gets filled and gets baptized by the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus had promised. And now heaven and earth are beginning to cooperate through this small community 
in Jerusalem, but spreading out across the entire world. And when you look at world history, you will actually discover, even secular historians have to acknowledge it, that almost within a generation, this small little community that started in Jerusalem had spread throughout most of the known world at that time. And even the world was saying, this group is upending the whole world. Like, what is going on? And uh, as, as bad as things are today, can I just tell you, the world is a very different place than it was 2,000 years ago. The work is not done, but you cannot compare today to 2,000 years ago and not acknowledge that Jesus has been on the throne doing some pretty incredible things, despite the fact that there's constant opposition to him and unbelief that's constantly trying to undo the good things he's doing. But it can't prevail. And so here's this man, Stephen, who's been filled with the Spirit. I love this. I just want to point out real quick for you for in, a verse, uh, in verse 10, it says, this was discussing this man, Stephen, who's, who's trying to preach the gospel. And it says, but they were unable to cope. I love that. They were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Oh, that that would be the testimony over the church today. They can't cope with the wisdom in the spirit. And then it goes on, and of course, Stephen is... He starts to, he's, he's brought before the high priest and, and he starts to give this amazing, he just starts preaching the gospel and it's amazing. And then I'm going to go to chapter 7, verse 49. This is kind of near the end of this, of this, he's kind of recounting the story of Israel and what God has been doing through the Holy Spirit and what his promises were and how it's now being fulfilled. And then he goes and he quotes Isaiah in verse 49, it says, heaven is my throne. Oh, sorry, sorry, 48. He says, however, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is the footstool of my feet. In other words, heaven reigns over the earth. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my rest? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Like human arrogance, like as if we could actually build a building that God could come and dwell in. Like, hello, God built the entire universe. And I don't know if you've listened to any of those who study the universe. It's a pretty big place. I mean, like, like we have to measure the universe. We can't even use normal units of measurement. We have to use light years, which is the travel that light travels in a year. And it travels at, what, 186,000 miles a second. So you can't even use, like, miles to measure the universe. You have to use something called light years. And it's still, like, millions and billions of light years. I mean, it's just like, how do you comprehend these things? So how are we going to build a house for God? And then he goes, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. And so that's like the spirit of Antichrist. Christ means anointing. It means to be the one who, who's been smeared in the Holy Spirit is the anointed one. So the Antichrist is that spirit which resists the smearing of the Holy Spirit. Amazing. All right. And so at this point, they go absolutely berserk. And they pick up stones and they begin to stone Stephen to death. They're infuriated. Now go to verse 56. Look what Stephen says. Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they were so infuriated, they actually covered their ears and raised their voice so they didn't have to hear what he was saying. Isn't that odd? And so the Holy Spirit opens the heavens. What does that mean, to open the heavens? What does the Holy Spirit do? What does the Holy Spirit do when he comes to you? What does the Holy Spirit do when he... By the way, baptism just means to be immersed. Like when we baptize you in water, we're going to dunk you. Like we're going to immerse you. We're going to surround you with water. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit means to be surrounded and immersed in Holy Spirit. Jesus' command to us was go and make disciples and do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
That's not a formula. That's not, he's not saying, listen, when you dunk him in water, say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over them. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, go and actually immerse people in the Father. You have a heavenly Father who loves you. Immerse them in the Son, Jesus, your Savior. Immerse them in the Holy Spirit. And then help them to understand and obey and to do all the things I've instructed you in the way that you get to live now in the kingdom of God. And so when the Holy Spirit opens the heavens, he opens up this unseen realm so we can properly relate to God. When the heavens are opened, you recognize Jesus for who he really is. The Son of God, seated at the right hand. When you can honestly say in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You see, you've had a revelation and understanding. Your, your mind and your heart has been opened up to this truth and this reality. Not some theory, not some nice philosophy that makes some people feel good and cope with life, but the actual reality and truth that Jesus is real, that he came in the flesh, he died, he was resurrected, and he's now ascended to that place of authority. When you have that revelation, that is the Spirit of God opening the heavens to you. And when the heavens are opened, God comes to you by his Spirit and he fills you with his very person and presence. And when the heavens are opened, you realize that God is sovereign over his creation so you can trust him. And you can come to him in prayer. You don't have to complain about the things going wrong in your life. You can come to a God you can trust and you can pray. Sometimes he gets you over the obstacles. Sometimes he just gives you the grace to endure something. Because in your endurance, you become a witness. And when the heavens are open, the power of God flows through you into this world to establish God's purposes. And next week, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That'll be fun. You should definitely come. It'll be as fun as this morning. We're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are these supernatural empowerments that begin to flow through your life, and they come in so many different forms, and they come in wisdom. They come in this thing called prophecy, which is amazing. It comes in terms of speaking in tongues. It comes in in terms of of healings and all different kinds of things. And there's all kinds of gifts. Some things have to do with things like administration. That's a spiritual gift that we really desperately need, actually, among our staff. Anyways, I won't go there. Um, When the heavens are opened, you see that you are a part of God's human family. So the Holy Spirit is creating this community He's opening the heavens. He's come down. He's dwelling in people, men and women and children. He's dwelling within them and he's creating this community so that heaven and earth can cooperate once again and let the power and the purposes of heaven flow onto the earth. Come on, is that not like worth having a little bit of that? A lot of it. Which, by the way, if you, if, if, if you get this, this is so, so basic to the gospel. This is what God is doing. That if, if you get this, you might understand why the Bible has not very nice things to say about things that bring division. Things like, like gossip or, or the refusal to forgive a brother and get, a, get offended. The things that would, that would begin to divide a brother from a brother or a sister from a sister or a brother from a sister. If you understand that the Holy Spirit is uniting us in Christ to work against that is to do what Stephen said, to resist the Holy Spirit. I just tell you, that's just not a smart move. Paul said that God will destroy those who destroy his temple. That was Paul's way of just, in a very um, poignant way, a very dramatic way of saying, listen, when you, when you work against God, Jesus said it like this way. It's like when you're resisting, it's like you're trying to throw yourself against a rock. All that happens is you get really beat up and bruised 
when you throw, imagine like taking your head and like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to move and break this rock, you know. Not smart. As thick-headed, as hard-headed as you might be, you're just not as hard as the rock. Like you're going to bust yourself open. Jesus said, trying to ignore God is like ignoring the rock that's over your head that's falling towards you. He said, you can't resist the things that God are doing. It's like banging your head against a rock, and you can't ignore the things that are happening because it's like the rock falling from the sky where you're standing. Like, just to ignore it, like, oh, well, yeah, no, 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 there's no rock coming. There's no rock coming. Like, splat. Like, anyways, that was a little extra for you this morning. We're going to pray in just about five minutes. And here's what we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for those who want to be baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. that be okay? By the way, the Bible actually says you should be continually filled. Because water is a common picture in the Bible for, for the Holy Spirit as well as this divine life that we talked about. But, but it's almost always pictured as a, as a river, as a flow. Because divine life is not just like, boom, you get a little bit, and no, okay. Because it's meant to be given out. Like if you're going to give out, then you've got to get in. Because if you give out without getting in, you just get empty eventually. But the same is true if you never give out, then there's no room for anything to come in. Which is why the very life of God, it's, you, you have to enter into the, into the blood. You have to enter into a place where you can let life, love be expressed by laying down your life and giving of yourself to others. And now you get this flow going. So the Bible actually says to be continually. It never says be filled as in once. It actually uses the, the ongoing. Be ongoing and continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Which means you've got to constantly be receiving and constantly giving. It's a flow. So you can never. Listen, when someone says we're going to pray for either the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Personally, I'm getting in line. Just saying. Maybe you don't need any more. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so real quick, I just want to go through real quick if I could, just some of the things that uh, Jesus said. Then we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite some of our team to come up and pray. I'm going to invite you to come up and we're going to pray. Jesus said a couple quick things. I just want to read these through. This is in John chapter 14, 15, 16. I know I'm going kind of fast. You can go back. John 14 through 16. Go back and take some time. We spent a ton of time this year in these, in these chapters. But I uh, just want to encourage you to go back. I just want to point out. I'm just going to kind of quickly grab a few places where Jesus specifically speaks of Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 14, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as our helper. And he helps you to know God. And he's with you and he's in you. And Jesus says, and when that happens, you know that you're not an orphan. You, the Holy Spirit, will help you know that you are a child of God. And just think about the implications of that for me. Like, that's worth just taking some time to think about what it means for your own life to be a child of the God who created the entire universe, <clears throat> who's good and who loves you and is watching over and is sovereign over everything happening. And that's why... Paul even writes, he says, the Spirit of God testifies to us that we are children of God and that we can call him Abba, which was the Aramaic way of saying Daddy, Papa. <clears throat> My granddaughter calls me Papa. It's such a cool term. It's like a term of endearment. Way better than grandfather. <laughs> 
but I am a grandfather, and I'm proud to say I'm a grandfather. I love being a grandfather, but, but, there's a, but, but she calls me Papa. It's a term of endearment. It's a term because she, she knows me. And so there's all kinds of things we can refer to, God, that are very appropriate to, to honor who he is. But the Spirit of God says, but now you can, ref- this one who is sovereign king of the universe, you can actually refer to him as dad. Whatever term of endearment means something to you, you can refer to God in that way. You can relate to him in that way. That's amazing. (laughs) Then he goes on, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said. In other words, he will be there to, to help guide you and to help you understand the things that Jesus has taught us because the things that Jesus has taught us are the very w- instructions in life of God. Like who wouldn't want to listen to that and live that out? And then he goes on and he says in chapter 15, verse 26, 27, he says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. And so you have a, so God begins to speak to you. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you now begin to hear the voice of God, the testimony of God himself to you. That's kind of worth it, I think. I remember when I was, a, when I was shortly after I got baptized in water and and I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't have the language to describe it back then, and I wasn't told that's what happened. But, but for me, it was, I literally felt like I had become alive. Like all of a sudden, I had known about God, and I would have told you I had faith in Jesus, but suddenly, it was like I knew him. Suddenly, I knew him. And then shortly after that, people began to encourage me, like, hey, you know, God wants to speak to you. Like, you can hear God. I was like, what? Like, why didn't someone tell me that earlier? You mean like the God of the universe will actually speak to me? From that day moment, I was like, I am wrecked for everything else. I don't care about anything else I want to actually hear from God. Like, that has got to be the coolest thing in the world. You know, and it was kind of a... For me, it was a kind of an odd, bumpy road to kind of, and I'm still kind of on it. And, you know, sometimes you think you hear God and you haven't, or sometimes you don't realize you have when you have. And there's a lot to learn about what it means to hear from God. But just that thought was like, it was completely revolutionary. Probably the most revolutionary thing in my life. But I could hear him. And when I began to realize that I could, suddenly I'm having dreams from God. Suddenly, I'm hearing like a small, still voice. Suddenly the word of God is like, it's like God speaking to me and all these other different kinds of things. And other people are beginning to say, hey, I feel like the Lord wants to speak to you. And, and they would begin to prophesy about my destiny. And all of a sudden, some of the things they said started to happen. Like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. So, so you begin to hear God. But here's the, it says, but then you will testify. You will testify. Now, we'll get this into a lot more next week because Jesus said, listen, you're going to receive power on high. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a power that comes into your life. He says, but it's a power to be a witness. And we'll talk about that because a lot of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given for this whole purpose that we can testify to who Jesus is. And they become this witness. And and, And for me, when someone else would begin to speak what they felt the Lord was sharing with them over my life, and, and then it would, it would open my eyes to things I had never considered. And then those things began to happen. It was like, that was a testimony to me. Like, whoa, God is real. And so we have this testimony and this witness, and it's amazing. So come next week. We're going to pray for gifts. But first, we've got to get you filled to get you baptized and then we're going to get those gifts going and then lastly jesus says this he says this when he comes to help of the holy spirit he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment by the way it says he will convict the world it doesn't say you have the permission to condemn the world it says he'll convict it 
And he'll convict it concerning sin. But listen to this. Jesus says, but concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. So lest you think you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit as an ambassador to go around criticizing everybody's faults and finding fault in people, that's not what Jesus said. He said, you are to witness, and it says, and the Holy Spirit will convict them of this sin, the lack of faith in Jesus. Everything else is just symptomatic. That's the one. And that's the one where, when the Holy Spirit works in someone's life and draws them back to the reality and the truth of the person of Jesus Christ. Let, let him do a new work in them. Your nitpicking just won't help. And your judgment, listen, you need help. <laughs> that's why Jesus said, just take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of someone else's. He didn't mean that you got more sin than someone else. All he meant was, listen, your issues will cause a whole lot more blindness in your life than somebody else's issues. Like somebody else's issue is not going to cause you to stumble in life. And if it does, that's your issue. Hello, like somebody else's problem shouldn't cause you to stumble and, and fumble around. But your issue will. Your own blindness. And so get that log out of your eye. And then if you see clearly, the Holy Spirit might just use you to help somebody else. All right. I've, we should pray, shouldn't we? Let's, all right. So, I, so like I said, Baptism means to be immersed. When we say filled, think about what filled means, and now we're going to pray. When you think about what filled means, it just means to be occupied by. When you fill a glass of water, that glass is now occupied with water. Okay? And so, like when you say your heart is filled with peace or your heart is filled with love, what you mean is your heart is now occupied by peace and by love. So to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to now be occupied by the Holy Spirit. Can we pray now? Okay, so if you want to just <clears throat> um, come on up, you want to be prayed. If you've never, if you have no idea what, what all this is, come up and just experience the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask some of our team to come up and uh, maybe you guys just put on some quiet music, but just come on up and we want to pray for you. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I didn't get a chance to kind of share my whole testimony, but, you know, I, I, began to profess faith in Jesus long before I joined a church, long before I really got baptized and, and filled with the Holy Spirit. And it, but it wasn't until I actually joined a church that I began to learn about these things. And then I began to, uh, was when I got baptized in water, and then when I got baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit, it came after I joined a community. And it's always been very significant for me. I think it's, it's part, of, part of the message because it's the Holy Spirit's building a community, so it's meant to happen within community. And one of the ways you see it happen in the Holy Spirit is it says that they would lay hands. And when they lay hands, someone would get filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason why that's so important is because hands just represent like a personal touch. And it also represents the fact that we're part of a, a body. The whole, the whole point is the, the Holy Spirit is, bring, is building us into a community. So there's something kind of beautiful about the fact that oftentimes we, we receive a filling of the Holy Spirit through the prayer of someone else. Not, not that, that like I have the Holy Spirit to give in that sense, like I'm sovereign over Holy Spirit and I give it to whom I wish. You know what I mean? Like that's really perverse. But it is meant to be kind of a picture. So, so of course you can receive Holy Spirit just sitting in your chair. Of course. You can be filled in your prayer time. I hope you are. But sometimes there's also something profound and significant about just taking a step to, to receive prayer and let someone lay hands as just a picture of your heavenly father touching you because Holy Spirit is sent from him, sent by Jesus. So if you want to just a fresh new infilling, listen, just because you've been a believer for a long time doesn't mean you don't need fresh infilling. I'm just telling you, you're, you're, I know many are in a season maybe of just feeling a little dry and it's never never too late to come back. It's never too late to get a prayer for fresh infilling. And so I just want to encourage you, um, you know, this is real. 